Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Geoff Denny for inviting me to give this talk, and I also thank you all for taking time to come, coming out here to listen to the talk. Uh, he gave me the title of the talk, right? <laughs> the Story of African Crops in American Garden. Uh, African traditional knowledge and plants travel with women and men during the Colombian exchange era, and enslaved Africans made major and lasting contributions to American agriculture. In my talk today, I will highlight attention to some of the major crops brought by Africans to the Americas, as well as how these crops had significant impact on American gardens or societies, or how they contributed to the Africanization of the plantation societies in the Americas. As a prelude to my discussion on the plant that traveled with Africans to the Americas, I will first define the meaning of the term Colombian exchange and explain briefly the nature of this broad exchange. Colombian exchange, the term was coined by uh, Alfred Crosby and the idea relates to the exchanges that took place between the about 15th century to the 19th century. And it's, the term is used to illuminate the two-way intercontinental transfer, intended and unintended, seen and unseen, of living species that follow the voyages of Columbus. Uh, Alfred Cosby coined the term in 1972. This is awkward. In, in one of his major works, which uh, he wrote as a guide to illustrating how the move, uh, how movements were very instrumental, instrumental to uh, biological transfer and plant transfer all over the world. The concept of Columbia exchange elucidates the transoceanic movements of plants and pathogens and animals that accompany the European mar maritime expansion, like I mentioned, from the 15th century to the 19th century. During this period, old world plants and animals were introduced to the new world. We know the major ones like sugarcane, which is a major crop that trans, uh, had a significant impact on the Americas. You can't talk about the development of the plantation societies in the Americas without referring to sugarcane. Also, other uh, animals like cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, and horses were introduced from the New World. And the so-called ranches economies of the New World uh, their development are related to the introduction of these particular uh, animals. During the period of Colombian exchange also, we find that American Indian or New World tables were also transported eastward. And I'm gonna show you a map of that. And some of the major crops that were transported eastward included maize, uh, white and sweet potatoes, manioc, tomato, peanut, and chili peppers. The food staples that originated from the uh, Americas had this significant impact on Africa, Europe, and Asia during this particular broad period. And here in the map, you see the nature of the exchange, how Goods we are moving from the Americas, particularly in this man, North America, towards Europe, and how goods we are moving from the old world towards the new world. And these are some of the crops that are listed generally. Now, these food crops, like I mentioned, had significant impact on uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia. <coughs> 
And I'll give you an example of some of the uh, impact of these crops on some of these societies. In Europe, for instance, the, they were, the potato was widely embraced in Ireland and to the extent that by 1840s, they had this uh, disease that affected the potato. They call it the potato plight. And because of over-dependence on potato, when they have famine during that particular year, it has very serious consequences on the people in that community, devastating consequences. And also, we find that Italians adopted the tomatoes, and the tomato became a very a central ingredient in some of the food products produced, uh, dishes produced by the Italians during this period of Colombian exchange. In West Africa, also, we often hear of the piquancy of the African or the flavors, the interesting flavor of, of the African uh, dishes and so on, right? They are related to some of these products that we derived from the New World, such as chili peppers. Maize was introduced also to West Africa by about the 15th and 16th century by the Portuguese who moved into the region. Peanuts was also introduced to West Africa and to China during this particular period in time. New World chocolate and tobacco, Asian tea and African co coffee, enlivened the salons and various communities that were located in Europe during this particular period in time. So there was this movement, movement of goods towards the Americas, but also Africa, and I will elaborate on this, contributed in moving products to other regions of the world, not only to the Americas, as I will come to uh, explain. Accidental biological introductions of the Colombian exchange included insects, weeds, microbes, and other opportunistic stowaways. During this period of the Colombia exchange, some old world diseases were introduced to the new world. And some of the important ones are stressed there, including smallpox, measles, influenza, malaria, yellow fever, typhus, and the bubonic plague. These diseases that originated from the new world had deep impact on the new world. And many of us who are conversant with the uh, story of enslavement in the New World and so on. Yeah. Many of you must have read the literature. You must be aware that at a point in time, these diseases led to the death of uh, a significant number of American Indians in the New World once they were introduced from the Old World into this area. And this is very significant because uh, the domination of societies is not mainly based on conquest, right? It is also tied to the introduction of diseases and so many germs and so on that were carried on during this particular period in time. Before I, I, I move on to African contributions, I'll end by talking a little bit about how Crosby, Alfred Crosby, kind of explain how these crops were moved from one part of the world to the other. He tied it to the settlement of new lands, not merely the conquest of the uh, new lands, but the settlements of new land. He, tied it not only to people who are naturalists, who study plants and so on, but to commoners, ordinary people who are moving from one part of the world to the other, taking along plants and other things with them 
to the new areas they settle in and try to develop those society to be uh, similar to the societies that they departed from, right? So they were moving across from one area and try to recreate the society from which they move away from in other regions. And that is how he explained the emergence of societies in New England, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, uh, how Europeans sought to create Europe in those particular parts of the world. And he called them or referred to them as Neo-Europe Neo in his work. <laughs> now, turning to African contribution to col the Columbia Exchange, we find that uh, this has been lightly diminished or ignored in the literature. And there are many reasons for this, but I'm going to elaborate on just two of these reasons. One is because of the long-standing narrative of a continent dependent of agriculture and husbandry that developed in other parts of the world. Today, uh, if you listen to the news or the popular media, the stereotype is that there is hunger all over Africa and people are dying of starvation and so on and they rely on aid from different parts of the world to survive, right? And this kind of have a negative impact on uh, the study of agriculture uh, or Africa's contribution in terms of agriculture to other parts of the world. The second reason is tied to the focus of Atlantic history. Uh, typically, what most people are aware of is that during the period of the Atlantic slave trade, uh, the Europeans brought in from Europe uh, textile products, uh, spirits, and they exchanged these for slaves in Africa. And these slaves were transported to the New World where they produced sugar, cotton, and so on that were in turn shipped to the Europe. These were the major commodities of the Atlantic slave trade, right? And often these are the major focus of most of the literature on this era of the Columbia Exchange. And therefore, very little attention is given to crop production because most of these crops are bulky, they are very difficult to transport, and they don't bring in much money like all of these other major items being cited. And therefore, most of the scholars studying this era tend to ignore or de-emphasize the issue of crops. Recent research, however, on Africa and Africans in the Atlantic world belies the perceptions of Africa as a passive recipient with few contributions of its own to the new world. And scholarship of Af on Africa has drawn a lot since the 1960s, significantly on different disciplines, right? Archaeology, the work of linguistics, the work of scientists, people who study crops, and so many other things, right? Historians have been able to draw on this to craft a narrative of how uh, plants originated, and even human beings. Uh, according to all of these scientific and other knowledge we've already acquired so far, Africa is the cradle of mankind. And of course, because of that, or partly related to that, we find that Africa also was a cradle to so many kind of agricultural productive activities, right? Right from the early period of time. We now know, and this is a map that shows some of the uh, crops produced in different parts of the world during the early uh, era. And you can see, I will talk a little bit more about rice, millet, and shogun later on. But this gives you a 
an idea that there were different independent centers of agricultural innovation where people first domesticating crops in various parts of the world. Africa also was included in all of this. Scholarship on indigenous African agricultural revolution shows that uh, Africa, first of all, domesticated, Africans domesticated cattle, right? Even before they started domesticating crops. We have over 2,000 species of plants in Africa, right? And not all of them are eatable. Many of them are poisonous, they are indigestible, and so on. And therefore, Africans were some of the earliest people that tried to identify some of these crops that were eatable, that would not be poisonous to other human beings, to people generally. And they domesticated them just like they started domesticating some of these cattle, right? And this process of domesticating plants started 7,000, about 7,000 years ago. And from that previous map, you can see some of the important uh, items that were domesticated, included millet and so on. And I'll show you another one later on that illustrated. Scholarship on indigenous African agricultural production also places Africa centrally within ancient Indian Ocean botanical exchanges that expanded over tropical repertoires in the millennia prior to European marital expansion uh, during the period before Columbus even reached uh, at the Americas and the Europeans started moving into various parts of Africa. We know, for instance, that African shogun and millets were already introduced to areas like India. And Africans also, during that period before Columbus moved to the New World, we know that Africans had already started adopting certain crops from the Asians. They've started, uh, they, they, they've embraced the cultivation of bananas and plantain in Africa, especially in the region of East Africa at that point in time. And over time, they were able to cultivate these crops and develop them into more than 120 new cultivars, generally in the continent. In addition to that, scholarship shows that just like the other transfers of the Columbia Exchange, the African biotech was carried to new lands aboard European vessels. In, in this regard, I'm talking about the new world, right? About the European vessels. Because be, prior to the 15th century, the Europeans hadn't developed these uh, strong ships that would sail the Atlantic. But by the 15th century, they had developed this. And it was these ships that were central to the movement of these crops to the new world. Between, between the 16th or 15th and 19th centuries, Europeans forced the migrations of more than 12 million Africans to the New World plantations and mines. In fact, until the beginning of the 19th century, Africa made up about three quarters of all immigrants to the Americas. And these about 12 million population of slaves, the movement of these slaves involved many slave voyages about 40,000 or so slave voyages, 35 to 40,000 slave voyages were involved in the movement of Africans from this, mainly from this coastal region, Atlantic coast of Africa. And I would like to 
point out here that you should note the names given to some of these coastal areas by the Europeans, right? Right here, they refer to this as the Green Coast here because they derive a lot of grain from here. Uh, ivory Coast, a lot of ivory. Here, go gold, right? So they label it according to the kind of item they derive mainly from their initial contact with these African societies, right? But most importantly, you can see they, re they refer to this place as Guinea, right? Upper Guinea, Lower Guinea, Guinea coast generally, right? So these are the regions, the coastal regions from where they derived the products from. Now, Africans were the ones who supplied the slaves, mainly to the Europeans. And most of these slaves were acquired mainly through warfare. There were different ways of acquiring slaves, but mainly through warfare. The soldiers involved in warfare, the slaves they captured, uh, needed to be fed, right? And some of them had to be moved from the interior to the coastal region, right, before the European ships would be able to convey them to Europe. Now, once they were moved to the coastal region, there was need to provide food for them because it wasn't immediately when they arrived there before the ships arrived from Europe to convey them to Europe. Therefore, there was a need to plant crops, to feed them, and to feed the Europeans, who were so a little bit, or a few Europeans were also based in the coastal area. Some of them were involved in agricultural production, producing some of these crops. We have Euro-Africans, right, who were also based here, who were involved in this commerce and in this trade also at this point in time. So there was significant need for food to feed the slaves and the people who are based in various parts of the West African coastal cities. Therefore, when the Europeans arrive with their ship, it is important to stress that most of this coastal area, we don't have natural harbors. The, the way you have in uh, you, many parts of Europe. We have very few, right? And therefore, sometimes, or in most cases, you find the ships anchoring somewhere in the sea. And some of the cr products that they got from the interior, from the coastal region, including slaves, will be conveyed to the ship by canals, right? Smaller canals. They will even put cattle and uh, other crops in this schedule and move them into the ship when they arrive. Slave ships carry food grown at their African ports of embarkation. And these food and crops were meant to feed the slaves and the crew on the slave ships generally, right? And they didn't only carry the, 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 the crops that were indigenously uh, uh, introduced in Africa. They also carried uh, some of these American in Indian crops that were introduced into Africa during the, this particular period. I mentioned maize and so on, right? So they carry some of these other crops and some other crops that they got from the Africans derived from the Islamic world, including cinnamon, uh, cardamom, and the things like coriander, right? They carry them into on board this slave ship. Now, once aboard the ship, they the slaves on board the ship were fed. No matter how little, they were fed with a lot of these items that were derived in Africa. And they, they also found some, some African crops like kola and very 
very useful during the Middle Passage because the water was very bad. The colano will give taste to the water when the, and it will make the slave less hungry during the course of the Middle Passage. So there were so many important uses for some of these crops during this movement of the slaves across the Atlantic. But the interesting to, thing to note is that the enslavers or the, the captains of the ship that brought the slave to Europe and to the New World were not interested in moving African crops intentionally into the New World, right? So that they will be grown in the New World. Uh, but the fact that they allow these crops to be carried on board their ship and to feed the Africans on board the slave ship meant that we find remnants of these crops on board the ships, right? So that when they get to the New World, this created opportunities for the Africans who anonymously appropriated some of them and subsequently moved them into the New World society. Therefore, the point here is that a lot of these crops were not intentionally introduced to the New World by the Europeans. They were, from their own point of view, these were not in intentional introductions. But for the Africans, nevertheless, these were intentional. Many African food plants were well suited to the growing conditions of tropical and tr subtropical America. Some of these African introductions, such as yam and plantain, require li very little labor to produce. And the slaves found this very, very valuable because compared to cassava, right? Cassava was time consuming, required a lot of labor and so on, right? And the advantages of the crops brought in uh, uh, by the Africans created uh, the need, uh, kind of made the Africans more interested in cultivating those crops as compared to the crops that they made in the New World. In addition to that, we find that other crops such as sorghum and millet were well adapted to the semi-arid climates and poor soils in various parts of the world, including the New World, because it's not all parts of the New World that you have very fertile soil and so on, right? So you have these crops that could easily be produced in significant quantity, even in semi-arid areas, right? And that, for the Africans, was very important because it enabled them to recover some of the familiar dietary prevences that, uh, and, and enabled them to survive their unfamiliar circumstances in the New World. In addition, to the crops they introduced, it is very important to stress that African farmers and herders were also interacting with the people who they met in the New World. And we find that they became increasingly familiar with some of the food crops that were produced in the New World by the American Indians and the people they interacted with during this particular period in time. Some of these Africans who moved to the New World were very good in medicine, right? They, they knew how to use herbs to kind of cure so many diseases. And they interacted with the Amerindians who themselves uh, also has 
similar knowledge. In addition to that, because many of these Africans came from the tropical region of Africa, they were already familiar with uh, plant and cross species that were found in pantropical environments that were produced by the Ameri Amerindians. Uh, and therefore, they easily could relate to these crops and they took part in the production of these crops once they moved into the new world. Overall, therefore, we find that the Africans, once they interacted with the American Indians in the Caribbean and the New World generally, they inherited some ethnobotanical knowledge of the American Indians. And in many parts of the New World, when the Amerindian population declined significantly, we find that it was left for the Africans to carry over the knowledge right, that they acquired and to kind of allow it to survive for generations thereafter. In this map, this is a summary of some of the crops that were introduced to the New World and some of their botanical names, right? I don't know what they mean. <laughs> but, but here you will see the common names of these particular crops that were introduced. Now, for the production of these goods, the Europeans relied mainly on the Africans. And many of them had knowledge of how to produce this crop right from Africa because they were involved in rice production, in the production of okra and so many other goods right from Africa. So they brought along this knowledge with them to the new world. Some of them were involved in livestock rearing right from Africa and they carried along their experiences also to the new world during this particular period in time. Now, once they got the products into the new world, there is evidence that it was at that point in time that many European naturalists started getting aware of some of these crops, including the slaveholders. They first encountered many of these food crops uh, and medicinal remedies in the slave plots and doorway gardens of the Africans. In the New World, in many societies of the New World, typically the slaves were allotted plots for their own use, right? is a kind of incentive for them, right, to enable the plantation system or whatever system was in place. And they typically grew these crops in those kind of lots or gardens awarded to them. We find that they found it very valuable to do this for several reasons that I will talk, I'm ready to talk about later on. But once the Europeans noticed this, we find that many of them were not aware of the names of these crops. And therefore, they were compelled to borrow some of the words the slave gave so many of these tropical plants, uh, the names for which the Europeans didn't have any names for at that point in time. And therefore, they borrowed names like yam, okra, aki, bene, banana, goba, and kombo, generally. For some crops already known to the African, Europeans affix the geographical descriptor. Some of the... Uh, uh, and I'll go back a little bit to the map. 
right? If you know TI, you will see Guinea. And uh, and therefore, because they knew that some of these come came from that region of Guinea, the Europeans simply labeled them as Guinea corn. Anything that came from that area, because they know the region from where they came from, they will refer to Guinea squash, Guinea sorrel, Guinea whatever, including some of these, uh, like guinea fowl, animals, and so on, right? They will just label them according to the name from where they derive these particular products from. African contribution to the Columbia Exchange also included animals. Like I mentioned, Africans domesticated some form of cattle, right, right from over 7,000 years ago. And this type of cattle were also introduced into the new world, including the African guinea fowl and, and other such animals. The African cattle invigorated the gene pool of the livestock population that came to thrive in the New World, tropical lowlands. Slaves raised the African guinea fowl, introduced at an early date to the plantation societies in their doorways, in their garden plots, and so on. And one thing that is very important to stress is that in Africa, some of these animals were often uh, uh, slaughtered uh, during re religious festivals and so on. And in the New World, we also find similar practices, right, in which you find Africans sacrificing some of these animals for religious rituals in the New World. Now, the cattle and all, all of these livestock, like I mentioned, were brought in initially through the kennel, then into the sheep, into the new world, right? But how do you feed them in the course of their movement from Africa to the new world? It presented the same challenge to the Europeans who were bringing the slaves, including all of these things. They needed to feed a lot of these livestock, right? And therefore, in order to feed this livestock, we find that the, uh, the animals were provisioned for the Atlantic crossing with fodder and um, bedding caught from the native African grasses, including all of these grasses that I mentioned here, the Guinea grass, the Angola grass, the Bermuda grass, and so on, right? So they were bringing in all of these items along with the slaves and so on that they were moving into the new world. These pasture grasses spearheaded a botanical invasion that environmental scientists has, have described as the Africanization of the new world tropics. Food stables that originated from Africa had deep impact on the New World, just like the, uh, the, the crops that were taken from the New World had deep impact on African society, like the maize became a major crop in Africa, right? The, the pepper, like I mentioned earlier on, if you are talking about the unique flavor of African food, you talk of the pepper and so on, right? It derived from the chili pepper that we got from the New World and so on. So similarly, the New World, the, the crops that were introduced to the New World had significant impact in, on the New World. They shaped the dishes that the enslaved Africans prepared for themselves, right? They were the kind of food they were familiar with that helped them to survive 
the hostile environment than that they found themselves. And also, they prepared some of these for the slave owner's table, right? And African ingredients have remained the defining culinary signature of former plantation societies. Okra, black eye beans, palm oil, plantain, rice, and this broad emphasis on greens that you find on fritters, sesame, confections, and so on, all are among the important African landmarks of the modern Atlantic foodway. In addition to that, the African cross provided cheap, abundant, and nutritious complex carbohydrate, which underwrote the demographic growth and social divisions that sustained the formation of the Atlantic economy. These crops provided sufficient nutrition to sustain the impoverished rural and urban laboring population throughout the new world. Not only throughout the new world, similarly they provide important food crops that sustain the African population in various parts of Africa, like I mentioned. They lower the cost of supporting larger families who were often led with less uh, land and poorer land, right? Because the plots that the slaves were given were often uh, on the less fertile part of the slaveholder holdings. In Africa, similarly in the New World, there's a pattern everywhere. And thus, because some of these crops were high yielding, this crop made available pool of uh, enough food that made available the pool of cheap labor that were used by colonial employers in the New World. Overall, therefore, the Atlantic world was a time and place where people from all the continents, its continents, the continents of the Atlantic world, including the Native Americans, the Africans, and the Europeans, they populated new landscapes with the crops, the animals that they brought from different places and populated new landscapes. A, po a multi multiplicity or semi-autonomous historical initiative at both the regional and trans-regional scales catalyzed the processes that shaped the environments in the three continents, Africa, Europe, and the Americas, creating a compound a compound Atlantic biome that all participants in the Atlantic world helped to create, including the Africans, from what I've already uh, tried to illustrate in my lecture. Thank you for listening.